Good day, everyone. It's a, it's a new year, and we are privileged to have Cathy Leung from the University of Hong Kong. Cathy is an assistant professor at the School of Public Health at the University of Hong Kong, and she's also a member of the HKU COVID-19 response team since January last year. In today's talk, she will discuss her work on using digital proxies of population mobility and mixing to track COVID-19 infections in real time. We will take questions after Cathy's presentation, so please do use the Q&A function to ask your questions. Also, please do vote for the questions that you would like us to address first. Um, without much further ado, Cathy, please. Um, thank you, Keisha. Um, I would like to thank Keisha again for giving me a chance to share our recent work on uh, real-time tracking and prediction of COVID-19 infection using digital proxy of population mobility and mixing. So this work is done with uh, my supervisors, um, Professor Joseph Wu and uh, Professor Gabriel Lai. Um, so our first, um, I'll first start with a, a very brief introduction of the natural history of COVID-19. So here, um, the figure shows a typical symptomatic infection of COVID-19. So as you can see, um, a person uh, is exposed um, here and it takes him um, about five to six days to develop symptoms um, because the mean incubation period is about five um, to six days. And in Hong Kong, it takes him another six, um, four to six days um, to be reported to the public health authority because um, usually it takes him two or three days to seek uh, medical attention and another one to two days to get um, COVID-19 testing and um, confirm. So usually by the time we see this case is reported to the public health authorities, it's already 10 days, at least 10 days um, since he's exposed or infected. So that's why we usually say, um, say that um, the observed data reflect um, past transmission events. But in fighting against the um, COVID-19 pandemic, what we usually want to know is the transmission um, probability or the transmission potential of this virus in real time. So um, here is a schematic illustration of um, a simulating, uh, simulated epidemic. So um, as you can see, um, at um, day 20, um, say for example, um, um, the public health authority already implement some uh, non-pharmaceutical intervention and these interventions start to take effect but at that time, the number of reported cases is still very low. And sometimes um, the public may question that uh, why the government implemented um, the intervention so early, even when the number of reported cases is still so low. But as you can see, um, even the intervention take effect at around day 20 and continue to take effect until day 30. At that time, RT dropped um, to below one, and the number of infections peak at around day 30. But at that time, this, when we um, look at the number of reported cases, the number is still rising. So un until the um, intervention take more effect um, at around day 38, the number of reported cases peak. So you can see from this figure that there's always a delay between um, the transmission events and the observe um, and the observations. So if we care about RT, um, which is a measure of transmission and time T, observations after time T should be adjusted. But how can we adjust it, the observations after time T to shorten the, um, this time interval or the delay between transmission events and the observations. There are many different ways um, researchers around the world will do. And one of them is that they try to look for more real-time um, digital proxies um, to track um, population mobility and mixing. So here are a few examples. 
um, I think most of you are very familiar with. So here, um, like some people in US or UK or Europe, they will make use of um, the Apple Mobility Trends Report or the Google COVID-19 Community Mobility Report um, and as well as um, Facebook data or um, city mapper data, um, city mapper mobility index, etc. And in mainland China, people usually use the Baidu mobility index or some um, payment usage data from um, payment app like Alipay and WeChat Pay. So that prompt us to look for the best um, mobility index uh, in Hong Kong as well. So the first thing, the first thing we think about is the octopus cut. So octopus cut is something like oyster cut in London. Um, it's first used to um, pay for um, the fares of public transportation. So as you can see, that the Chinese name of the octopus cut here can directly translate as eight arrive pass, which in which eight in Chinese means many. And then this name can be directly translated as reaching everywhere. And as you can see here, the logo of the octopus cast um, feature a mobile strip and in the shape of an infinity symbol. In Hong Kong, um, different age group will use different types of octopus cast for um, specific discounted fares in public transportation. For example, um, children aged three to 12 will use um, the pink cards and um, students aged 13 to 26 um, use the purple cards and um, elderly aged 65 or above will use the uh, green cards and adults will use this um, color card. So, um, if we can use, uh, we can obtain um, octopus uses, usage data by these card types, then um, it can tell us some of the age information in um, the mobility as well. The coverage of octopus cards is, quite, is actually quite high in Hong Kong. Um, they are used by 99% of the population in Hong Kong age 16 to 65, and the system handles more than 14 million transactions on a daily basis, including all types of um, small value payments, including travel, dining, um, entertainment, and shopping. But now um, we have the so-called best uh, mobility index in Hong Kong, but how can we correlate RT and the mobility level um, in Hong Kong um, using the octopus data. So the first thing is we try to estimate RT in Hong Kong first. So on the right hand side, you can see um, this is the epidemic curve of the first wave and second wave in Hong Kong by um, date of confirmation. And the second, and the second, um, and the second graph uh, shows shows the epidemic curve by um, date of symptom onset. So as we discussed just now, there's always a delay between um, infection and reporting of about 10 days. So how can we adjust for this delay? We first use a deep convolution based method to reconstruct the COVID-19 epidemic curve by date of infection. The idea is to shift the um, epidemic curve by confirmation date back by 10 days. But it's not simply to um, shift the epidemic curve um, left, but instead we need to apply um, a method called deconvolution, which, can, um, which is documented in um, the recent paper by um, on PLOS computational biology. So it's an iterative uh, method um, but um, in short, so um, on figure B, we, um, we show the deconvoluted uh, epidemic curve by infection day using the brown curve. So as you can see, the brown curve is like um, shifting left, 
the um, orange bar here. So now we use the different convolution method to reconstruct both epidemic curve of local cases and imported cases. And then we estimate RT for both imported cases and local cases in Hong Kong on each day um, using the FPSD package. So here um, in figures D and D, we show the RT of local cases and RT of uh, imported cases respectively. As you can see, um, the RT are quite different for um, these two groups be because at that time, um, Hong Kong has already implemented 14-day um, um, compulsory quarantine for all the imported cases. For local RT, RT dropped um, from about 2.8 during the first wave to um, below one. And then by the end of February, RT start to increase because uh, many students from UK and the US came back to Hong Kong and which drive the second wave. And then um, during the early um, March, um, the Hong Kong government has implemented very stringent um, social distancing measure such as um, school closure and um, all the, and they also require all the civil servants to work from home. RT start to drop. And then um, by the end of uh, March, um, RT dropped to nearly um, 0.2 or 0.3. So which mark the end, marks the end of the um, second wave. But the question is how can we um, find out the relationship between LT and um, the local LT and the mobility index in Hong Kong. So the next step is we um, the next step we try to select the uh, most suitable mobility or digital proxy for um, population mixing in Hong Kong. As we mentioned just now, um, autopus cars are um, is are used for different kinds of um, small uh, value payments. So as you can see here, we can stratify the octopus data by cut types such as adult, child, elderly, by um, transportation means such as subway, buses, minibus, and also by retail categories such as fast food, convenience store, and supermarket sales, um, also as, um, also as um, personal care and household um, sales as well. So here we are not doing very complicated calculation, but simply we want to find out the best um, digital traces for proxies for mobility and mixing. So we calculate the, um, cor the Pearson's correlation coefficient for um, different subcategories of octopus usage data and the local RT. We found out that um, public transportation data can correlate with um, the local RT the best. Um, so for example, here, the adult transport data from Octopus um, in RT correlate quite well and the correlation coefficient is about 0.8. So um, we decided to use um, the transport data from Octopus by cut types to as the best um, proxies for population mobility and mixing. So the next, um, and we also find out that um, we also try to compare with um, other uh, mobility index uh, available in Hong Kong. We found that octopus transport um, data actually outperform other mobility indexes in um, Hong Kong, such as um, City Mapper, Google, or um, Apple. The next question is, um, how can we make use of these um, mobility index? So I think this um, quantum matrices are quite familiar to um, most of you in the London School because uh, I know that London School is conducting um, a daily or weekly survey of contact patterns um, before or during the uh, pandemic or before, after any um, 
MPI implementation as well. So here we try to um, make use of the um, octopus mobility data and try to infer the quantum matrices from uh, mobility data. We use G A of T to denote the normalized number of octopus transportation transaction for H A on day T. And then we assume that the number of infectious contacts between H group A and B at time T could be modeled as gamma A um, times G A of T, gamma B times G B of T. Here, gamma A and gamma B are the scaling factors for the digital proxy of H group A and B respectively. So the problem is now um, how we can estimate the scaling factor gamma A and gamma B from the um, case data. So under this um, formulation, um, the average rate at which an individual in age group A may infectious contact with age group B at time T is um, can be um, formulated with the beta here. So here beta A, B, is the um, in, um, transmission coefficient and we can use the beta um, matrix to construct the time varying next generation matrix for an SIR model. I think these are quite um, um, a standard approach for most of you in the London School and we can then estimate the effective um, reproductive number LT um, using the dominant eigenvalue of the next generation matrix. So then we estimate gamma A and gamma B uh, from the case data by fitting the epidemic model to the observed number of confirmed cases on each day. Then we can get a gamma matrix, um, knock out the gamma vector, gamma A and gamma B, um, for each age group. It's kind of like a mapping between uh, LT and the octopus data. So actually we can do it over time. Like for example here, um, if we do it at, um, we do it on March 15 with um, all the cases data up to um, March 15, we can for, we can now cast the number of um, infection um, by March 15. And if we assume the mobility level remain the same for um, a week, we can do a little bit forecast as well. Because as we know that we if we do the now cast and forecast on March 15, at that time, we can't, um, at that time, although all these cases have been infected, but some of them haven't been um, reported to the public health authority yet. So here we can see that if we um, perform the now cast on uh, March 15, we can only see the red bars here. So all the red bars are cases reported before um, March 15, and the orange bars show um, orange bars show um, the number of cases reported after uh, March 15. But with this mapping of um, LT and octopus data, we can actually estimate the number of infections, the number of onsets, the number of reported cases over time using um, the mapping between um, octopus data and uh, LT. So we can do the inference. Um, we can adjust the inference and do the inference um, um, every day and do this kind of now counts and forecast. So here uh, we show um, um, five different time points. And I think the now counts and forecast are performing quite well and the 95% confidence interval um, of the prediction of case number usually cover the actual case number except for um, a few time periods uh, in late February and in mid um, March. 
Um, so that prompt us to look at why the performance um, in these two time periods are not that good. And then this is also one of the questions, um, um, one of the questions raised by the paper's uh, reviewer. So here we try to use a few measures to um, assess whether the model is doing the prediction, the now cast or the forecast accurately. So um, as you can see um, by all these, all these six um, measures, the prediction is not, um, is less accurate um, in late February and in mid March. And then we go back to look at why the prediction is not that accurate um, in these two time periods. We find out that um, our model is actually less accurate when there are super spreading events. So in late February, there is um, a cluster of about 20 people um, who attended the, a temple in North Point in um, Hong Kong. And then in um, mid-March, there's a very big cluster called Bar and Bank Cluster, consisting of, of uh, more than 100 people, um, which accounts for more than 30% uh, of all the cases in the second wave. So, so um, that's quite, uh, intuitive to us why the model can, cannot perform quite well when there's a super spreading event because um, octopus data can track the mobility level of the population in general, but the emergence of super spreading events sometimes uh, would link to the stochastic events, which cannot be tracked by the octopus data. And another limitation is that after we apply the um, this kind of method on the first wave and second wave, um, after we submitted the paper, uh, we have the third wave and fourth wave in Hong Kong. But then we found out that the mapping of mobility proxies and RT are different in different ways. So um, it doesn't mean that the methods cannot work. It just means that the uh, estimated gamma, gamma A and gamma B we talked about just now, uh, from the first two waves cannot be directly used in the third wave and the fourth wave. So um, we are still looking at this kind of problem, but um, we, we think it might be, uh, it might due to um, the different levels of, um, different levels of uh, public awareness in complying with um, the social distancing, distancing measures and different MPIs um, across different waves. And even you can sh see from this figure, this figure shows the um, octopus transport level since January. You can see um, from, this, from the first wave and second wave, um, octopus mobility dropped quite quickly once um, the MPI are implemented, but in the third wave and the fourth wave, um, the mobility dropped um, more slowly than the previous two waves. So we are still looking at um, this kind of trend and to see why people are not um, complying with um, these um, MPIs as well as before, but um, I think it's, it's probably due to the response fatigue. So now people are quite tired of the pandemic now. And even though we are applying or implementing the most stringent measures now, they are less likely to comply with um, the MPIs anymore. Another limitation of the octopus data is that octopus um, data reflect the mobility levels of 
working adults better than um, other age group because the daily usage of autopus cards among adults is much higher than uh, among children and the elderly. And uh, autopus data reflect the mixing level of adults much better than um, elderly and children because um, different age groups in Hong Kong will have um, tend to have very different activities during the pandemic. As you can see from these pictures, um, elderly in Hong Kong will go to, um, say for example, temple, wet market, and parks more often, as well as in some while, young people in Hong Kong would like to uh, have staycation or vacation, um, this kind of um, activities they invented during the pandemic, as you can see. So this is a picture of hotel rooms. So you can see there are eight hotel rooms. People are having birthday party uh, in the hotel rooms. And flycation is like a very weird activity as well. So people pay to um, fly over Hong Kong for 1.5 hours. So it's a departure in Hong Kong and arrival in Hong Kong as well. So apart from uh, Autopus data, we are trying to um, use different kinds of props, other proxy to track the um, COVID-19 infection in Hong Kong. So this is one of the um, one of the um, methods we have been using recently. So um, it's like we call um, we work with the Department of Engineering. Um, in HKU to to test the um, to test whether there are any um, COVID nineteen RNA in the sewage water, and we actually uh, found that um, even though there is there's no cases reported from um, say this Feng uh, Chat House in Choi Wan Estate, um, if we require all the residents of this um, building to go testing, we, we actually find um, several infected um, individuals with no symptoms. But then after they are quarantined, um, several of them develop symptoms. I think we actually find um, five, or, five or seven uh, residents infected by um, COVID-19 during the uh, pre-symptomatic um, stage. So um, that's the end of my presentation. I would like to um, acknowledge um, the, um, acknowledge um, Octopus. I'd like to thank Octopus Class Limited to provide us the Octopus data for analysis. I would like to thank um, HMRF and um, GLF and Air at Indo Hong Kong for providing us um, funding for this kind of re research. And um, I'd like to um, have a, an advertisement here. So um, D24H is a center um, hosted by um, the Hong Kong Science Park. And um, the director of D24H is um, our Dean Professor Gabriel and there are uh, several um, program leads, uh, which many of you are very familiar with. And we are hiring a lot of um, assistant professor and postdocs to work with us to develop um, AI for um, um, health research. So that's at the end of my presentation. I'll, happy, I'll be happy to take um, questions. Thank you so much, Kathy. I think it's fascinating to see how people spend their holiday seasons during a pandemic, staycations, flycations, and you know this cruise to nowhere that we have in Singapore. But you're right, unfortunately, across the globe, we see the pandemic fatigue setting in, making it more challenging for us to contain the epidemic. Um, we'll now take questions for Kathy. Uh, um, please do use the Q&A functions to ask your questions and also vote for the questions that you would like us to address first. 
Um, but as the chair, I would like to take the privilege of actually asking you the first question. I was wondering, um, is the Hong Kong authorities concerned about any, you know, the variants that are circulating in other countries, the new variants, and what kind of measures are in place? Which ones would you think would be bet better enhanced to actually, you know, act on it and to prevent the spread of this new variant circulating in Hong Kong? Um, I, we did a preliminary uh, analysis of the new variants uh, using the um, GIS AID sequences online. We estimated that um, similar to the London School estimate, we estimate the variant is um, about 75% more transmissible than the 501N lineage. So um, that's why um, this prompts us to inform the uh, Hong Kong government to currently block all the flights from UK and um, South Africa. But um, I think that's before um, Christmas, but then now we see um, many um, other countries are seeing this um, local transmission of the new variants. So I think I think probably um, it's so I think blocking flights from UK and South Africa will not help much if um, local transmission is established in other countries. But then we have to do more in. Um, quarantining the imported um, cases, especially now, I think the Hong Kong government start to um, quarantine all the overseas inbound travelers for 21 days. And I hope this will help stop um, the transmission of the new variant. And then the, um, the Hong Kong government is also um, trying very hard to get uh, vaccines. So I think I think um they can. I heard that <laughs> the news that they they can get a uh, vaccine, um, the first batch of vaccine in February, and I hope uh, more vaccine will be available soon for um all the Hong Kong people here in Hong Kong. Thank you so much. Okay, so we have questions coming in from the attendee. So the very first question is actually by Yang Liu. Is the octopus card associated with socioeconomic status? Well, all people tend to be able to take more time off from their work when needed and may not uh, need to use public transportation as much. Perhaps they get around by public, uh, private transportations, either by driving or by, you know, taxis and whatnot. So... Um, I think uh, most of the Hong Kong people use... Pub I think the coverage of public transportation is um, quite high in Hong Kong, similar as Singapore. So even very well of people they they also use public transportation a lot but um but i think um yes but the coverage of i think i think if uh uh young us is octopus cast associated with social economic status i think yes but um the, even but i think it's a um Let's so for let's so for a problem in Hong Kong because the coverage of octopus cars is really high. So even they tend to um, spend more time off from work. Um, they yeah we we still can see um, they use um, octopus cars quite often even for those rich people as well. Mm. So I was wondering perhaps a follow-up question from Rosie who uh, sent it to me privately. She was just asking if, do you have any ideas of any types of useful data that uh, data sources that could be used? Um, since sometimes it seems that mobility data can decouple from transmission. So like other than mobility data, what other piece of information do you think or different data sources do you think can be useful to explain transmission in going on in the country or like in Hong Kong, for example? Yes, we um we actually think about that because as um Yang just mentioned, like autobus data might correlate with uh, public transportation much, but uh less so for um the mobility within the community or within walking this distance. We are actually thinking about to get the Wi-Fi usage data from the shopping malls, like 
um, like Hong Kong, we have um, those small shopping malls um, next to the residential buildings, um, which um, many of them are hosted by the Hong Kong government. We are actually talking to the Hong Kong government to see if we can use, we can obtain the Wi-Fi, the public Wi-Fi usage data um, to help us um, improve this model. Um, and also we are, <clears throat> We are also looking at um, other um, data sources, such as maybe um, the car parks data. So, um, so if uh, autobus data correlate with um, the um, public transportation in working days, then if people drive more on um, holidays, then they will use car parks more. Then we are we are thinking about using car parks as well, and also. Um, different other methods to track um, the um, activities. Say for example, uh, we are also thinking to uh, obtain um, the booking data of restaurant, restaurant booking data and see whether, um, whether um, people are going out for dinner more um, if the uh, interventions are relaxed. And yeah, that, we are we are trying to make use of a little bit um, more um, different mobility data to improve this kind um, of model. So we have a comment actually, rather than a question coming in from an anonymous attendee. Um, the fact that and the person writes the fact that RT correlates with the use of transport does not mean that the transmission um, occurs during transportation. Instead, it could mean that there are more opportunities for contact while staying in other places where people who uh, can move and meet, for example, at workplaces. So do you agree with, uh, with what this person has yeah, to say? I think so. to I, I, yeah, I, I, I think so. I think uh, by using the octopus data, we are trying to, uh, we, are, we didn't mean that the, infection occur or the transmission occurs during transportation. We just use that as an index of the mixing of um, mobility levels, but we doesn't, uh, we didn't mean that um, the transmission occur in transportation only by, so by using um, public transportation, people go to work, people um, go to uh, entertainment and people, um, go to school, et cetera. So it's not necessarily that the transmission occurs during transportation, but instead it means um, uh, when we see the increase in octopus data, it means people um, contact more. So, so yeah, I think I agree with this comment. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so actually, Rosie, Rosie has another question for you. Um, she can't use the chat function, so I may, I will just read out her question that she sent mm -hmm. over. Uh, we, she was actually wondering, um, in the methods um, that you've developed, um, how would they, how would it be able to, um, to sort of uh, correctly um, track for low versus high prevalence setting? Uh, she imagines that they would work better in a sustained transmission setting as opposed to mm -hmm. a place where, you know, there is probably no transmission going on or something. Do you have any comments on that? Yeah, I agree uh, because um, here we use the octopus data to uh, reflect the mixing of the, con actually the contact mixing um, levels. But as you can see, maybe in, in this figure, so say, um, so, so here, for example, after the first and second wave, we have a very peaceful period until the third wave in July. But at that time, the mixing level is quite high. But if there's no seat in the community, there's no um, outbreak, right? So even, even, the trend, um, even the contact level is sky high, if there's no transmission seat, there will be no outbreak. So um, we will expect um, um, the um, transmission or the RLT will decouple from the contact, um, contact level when there's only sporadic um, uh, cases in the community like in Singapore um, now. So I think the contact level might have resumed to normal 
or near normal level in Singapore now, but we still um, see a very low number of cases. Yeah. Well, so I, th I guess there are no further questions. Thank you so much, Kathy, for sharing your work with us. Um, it's, been more, it's been more than a year since the world was alerted to the first COVID-19 case, but the fight against the virus goes on. So once again, uh, everyone, thank you for tuning in to the CMMID seminar. Do join us next month for the next seminar. Thank you so much. And thank I you. hope every one of you can stay healthy and um, stay well. Thank yeah. you so take much for inviting me for the seminar. Take care. Take care.